victory life. Are we ready for church? Oh, man, uh, those, those were moments of just last weekend's baptism where 60 people had signed up for baptism, and it was our second baptism this year. And so, man, if that, if that just doesn't warm your heart, uh, isn't that amazing? I'll just say that. That is just amazing to see. Well, I tell you what, uh, I just want to greet everybody uh, that is here today, our first-time guest, a special welcome to you. My name is Pastor James. I'm the lead pastor here at Victory Life. Uh, interesting week. Pastor John, who helps with the service, he faded and uh, went out sick with the flu on Tuesday. No worry. Pastor Matt is my backup plan. And uh, Pastor Matt was supposed to preach today. Guess what happened to Pastor Matt? Out with the flu. And so, uh, so you got me. That's what I'm saying. And... <laughs> So, uh, um, so on Thursday he called and he said, I'm out and I've got the flu too. So here's what we're going to do. I want to welcome everybody. Uh, I'm going to preach this service and then I've got to catch a flight to Washington, D.C. I've been asked by APEC to come down and help lobby this weekend and meet our congressmen and senators to lobby for Israel and some Israel uh, legislation. So yeah, I'm going right into the lion's den, so be praying for me. So I've got just enough time to preach the snot out of this service here, leave it all on the court. Maybe I shouldn't say snot when there's a lot of stuff going around. Bad choice of words. But anyway, this is the only one I'm doing, so I'm just going to leave it out here. But here's the thing. We're going to film this, and we're going to show up for the 11 o'clock and the 1230. So let me just start by welcoming all our first-time guests, everybody that's watching online. And church, this time, help me welcome the 11 o'clock, the 1230. Love you guys. You're awesome. Good, good, good. Well, uh, I'm just going to highlight also this Saturday, you know what's happening, Saturday Night Church is coming back, 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock, and so we, we, we want to encourage you, if, uh, if that works with your weekend better, we now give you that option, 5 o'clock, it's going to be the exact same service, uh, 5 o'clock on Saturday starting this week, and then, um, and then we'll have the three services still on Sunday morning. So life is just getting better and better. You guys just keep inviting your friends and family. We'll keep doing 60 baptisms at a time and uh, we'll figure out where the next service is added after that, okay? Good problem to have. All right, well, if you have your Bibles with you, let's click them on. Let's turn them on uh, and let's go to Ephesians. Um, let me make this Ephesians chapter 4. We're in our series called Clear Vision. Small groups are meeting. Uh, what I'm going to do is just kind of run through it real quick. You can say it with me. Um, the first one, this is our vision here at Victory Life Church, seven steps vision, meaning this. This is how we make disciples. This is how we minister to the community and to the body of Christ that God's put on our hearts. Everything in our hearts, our mission as a church or our vision as a church is to see people saved, in week one, we heard that your, your egg is cooked, man. Once you give your life to Jesus, it, it's his. And, uh, and, and also this, it is a gift. Don't try to pay for a gift. It cheapens the gift. And that's important because we're going to be talking about works today. So it's to be see people saved, healed. When does God want you healed? He wants you healed all the time. And here's the thing. He heals today, and you will be healed 100% of the time. Just sometimes it's on this side of eternity. Sometimes it's on the other side of eternity. But God still is in the healing business. Can I get an amen? amen. Saved, healed, set free. Freedom isn't a, a moment. Freedom is a lifestyle. He wants to see you saved, healed, set free, discipled. We, we, we looked at uh, discipled last week, and it's painful to resist, isn't it? He says, Paul, don't kick against the goats. It's painful. It hurts. And so when we want to do things our own way, it inflicts pain in our lives, not because of what God, uh, God is mad. It's because we're resisting the spirit, and that can be painful in our lives. So now that we're caught up, saved, healed, set free, discipled, today is going to be equipped. Now, this is, this is really important on this one, and it's important to know that as we take a look at the role of what some would call works, salvation is free, 
But what we do with our faith, how we act out our faith, how we live our faith, it does make a difference. Equipping is learning how to build the character so that we can walk in the anointing and the victory of God. You, you look uh, throughout scripture, and, and so I, I look at this, equipping is the framework that holds the victory of God or the presence of God. You gotta build that framework. We see throughout scripture when, when God's anointing surpasses people's character. And, and so maybe you're looking for a breakthrough in your life. This is gonna be a key to build the character so that you can walk through that, that breakthrough in your life, that you can receive that. You look at Samson. Samson is in the Old Testament, an actual person anointed with supernatural strength, and, and Samson's gifting or anointing took him to a place where his character couldn't keep him. We see this all the time, don't we? People's success gets beyond their character and they implode. And so to walk in all the fullness that God has, we need to build this framework called character so that we can walk in that. You know, even throughout the Old Testament, when did the people of God, the Israelites, stray from God? When things were going good. It's when things got bad, all of a sudden they realized we better repent and come back to God. God starts to bless them, what do they do? They drift from God again, why? Because their character wasn't matching the plan or the anointing of God in their lives. So, so here's where I wanna encourage you, I, I wanna show you the importance of being equipped and how to get equipped. You know, it's amazing, 70% of the people that win the lotto are bankrupt in four years. Why? Because they don't have the character, the disciplines in their life to handle the resources. Equipping is learning the discipline so that you can handle the resources or the things in your life. When the muscle cars came out, originally, back in the early muscle cars, late 50s, they started to put speed under the hood, the, the big blocks. We get into classic muscle cars of the 60s, then you got your Camaros, you got your Road Runners. You know what the limitation was? The limitation wasn't the horsepower, the limitation was the strength of the frame. That literally, they had so much horsepower, it could destroy and rip apart the frame of the car. That it wasn't until the unibody chassis came in that the frame could now support the power. This is the difference between this week of equipped and next week is empowered. The frame is your character so that it, if, if you don't have character, the power and the favor of God will just rip you apart. And, and so this is what we see from time to time. So we see it in Acts chapter 19. And I'm kind of moving at a good clip here because uh, of communion. I've, I've got... I've got a two-part sermon I'm going to give in 22 minutes. So, But in Acts chapter 19, I think it relates to a, a place that I've been a lot of times. And that is, uh, I, I'm, I'm praying for things uh, over my years of walking with Christ. There's times I was praying for things in my life, but I wasn't putting the work in to get it done. We, 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 we want the empowerment, but we've got to show up for the practice. I like what Joe Frazier said, the ring doesn't, the ring doesn't, uh, the, 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 the boxing ring doesn't make a champion, it simply reveals the champion. Meaning it's the guy that showed up and put in all the practice, it's the guy that trained hard for it, and it's revealed when he gets into the ring. In Acts chapter 19, we, we, we see this priest and his sons called the sons of Sceva. They didn't have a framework that they were equipped, but they began to minister and cast out demons. And here's the thing, they, they didn't have a personal relationship. And so they went, they skipped the equipping stage and went right to the empowering stage and they started to cast out demons. And this is, I love, this is what they would do. They would go up to a demon-possessed guy and they would say, in the name of Paul, who preaches Jesus, we command you <laughs> to come out of him. They actually had a measure of success. And then the Bible says, finally, the demon one day, it says one day, which meant they were having some success. It says one day the demon goes, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And it said that the demon that was in the man 
overpowered the sons of Sceva and gave them such a beating that they ran naked and bleeding from the, from the situation. True story in there. What, what happened? We had people trying to invoke the power of God over a situation, but they didn't take the time to be equipped and develop the framework in which to live their lives. And so I really want to help you build that framework because so many, there's times in our lives we're looking for that breakthrough. And we're just crying out to God. But there's disciplines in our lives that do make a difference that manifest his victory. Listen, everything I'm going to give you today has nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is free. Salvation is from the blood of Jesus. But everything I'm saying today will help you have the life that God wants you to live in this time here. Salvation is for eternity. But he wants you to have the abundant life today. And to have the abundant life, you've got to be equipped. And so in Ephesians chapter 4, are we doing good? Okay, in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, um, I'm going to read the New Living Bible first, and, or I'm sorry, the NIV first, and then I'm going to give you the New King James because there's one word I want to focus in on there. But in the first verse it says, as a prisoner of the Lord, this is Paul talking, and Paul in the previous chapters, one through three, has given some truths to the people. You are the righteousness of God, you are sanctified by God. He gave them these truths, but now he's in this chapter, and in chapter four he's going to switch gears. And he's going to go, now that you have these truths, that's your framework, now I'm going to show you how to start to apply these things, how to be equipped to live your life. And so he goes, as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. I want your life to look the same as who you really are in Christ. And, and so he goes, I urge you. Now, in the New King James, it, it says this. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of your calling with which you are called. And I like the word walk because there's 10 different times in the, in the New Testament it talks about our walk, how we're to walk. He goes, I want you to walk this thing out. You are the righteousness of God. You are sanctified by Christ. You are healed and set free. Tomorrow when you go to work, I want you to walk that way. That's what he's saying. In fact, he goes, I implore you. I beseech you. I urge you. Why? Because the world needs to see what a person looks like when he's healed, set free, and born again. You are no longer an orphan. But now you are no longer a slave, but now you're a son and you're a daughter. I urge you, I beg you, I beseech you, walk tomorrow in that light is what he's saying. Now there's only one problem. Walking is painful, isn't it? You don't have the right shoes, you're going to get some blisters. You know, ladies got those nice shoes, they look good, they're uncomfortable as can be, they're painful as can be, but they look good, right? Walking's painful. When you're learning how to walk, you fall, you, you, you scuff your knees, you, you bust a few teeth sometimes. You got to get back up and you got to walk it out. Walking's hard when you begin. If you never get up to give it a try, you never walk. The only way you learn it is to get out there and start doing it and putting one foot in another. If you fall down and you never get up again, you'll never learn to walk, that it's part of the process. And, and he's beginning to show you that the equipping measure of a believer in Christ, this is what life looks like. It's not tied to salvation, so when you fall, it's okay. You're still a son, you're still a daughter. Just get back up and start walking again. Because every time you get back up, you get a little stronger in your faith. Every time you get back up, you get a little more equipped than you were the time before. That a part of it is to to fall and to get back up. Then there's times when your back goes out. You need some friends to come along and help you get up. I was walking one time we were at the emergency room. my, My back had seized up. And they took my blood pressure and they said, you're in a lot of pain. I said, yeah, yeah. That's why I said that. And uh, (laughs) he goes, well, let's get you back and give you a shot. And he goes, can you make it back? I said, I can make it back. And so we're moving real slow. I'm kind of going like this. And the the nurse has his uh, finger in my belt loop. And just then I had a spasm and my knees went like this. And I felt him just kind of grab my belt loop and give me a wedgie and bring me right back up. (laughs) 
I said, if we don't move for a moment, I think we're good. Let's just stay here for a moment. <laughs> Some deep breaths. And then we started moving again. Sometimes you need a helping hand to walk things out. You've got to be intentional. You've got to show up for the practice. You've got to put the work in. The disciplines of faith, disciplines of fasting, the disciplines of reading the Word of God, these are disciplines, but they equip us so that we can handle and walk into the power of God that he's trying to release into our lives. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that's going to last forever. Part of our faith is strict training. Training, a lot of time, training isn't any fun. Anybody go to boot camp? Boot camp's not fun. Marines have a saying, if it ain't raining, we ain't training. The more miserable it is, the more effective the training is. And, and so it's not fun, but the results are incredible when you get to the other side. Your faith, my faith, it has to go into strict training. There's things that we do that just aren't comfortable, and initially, they're not fun. But when they equip us, they become so enjoying. It says, therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the ear. No, I beat my body and I make it my slave that after I preach to others, I myself might not be disqualified. It, it is like parallel parking. <laughs> this is the thing everybody hates on the driver's test, right? Man, I have nightmares of when I was learning how to parallel park. But my dad was one of those guys that could parallel park anything in any spot. He drove the Greyhound bus and uh, tour buses, and I'm telling you, you give him six inches on the front bumper and two inches on the back, and that dude's going to park the bus. And so I was just always proud of my dad. So I just, I just remember we were practicing for the road trip or for my driver's test, and my dad took me out, and I just happened to get lucky and back that in. I mean, there was attempts, attempts at failure, honk horn, so everybody's going crazy. It's like, go around, and we're going to be a while. And, but there was one time I nailed it, and my dad looked at me, and he said, you're pretty good at this. That's all it took, man. I love parallel parking. I look for a challenge now. I circle the block. My wife looks at me, and she goes, you have got to be kidding. I said, I got this, man. Let's go. I love parallel parking now, and it's no fair that they make it automatic. That's cheating. Give me your man card. Learn how to do this. Things I enjoy now, like budgeting. I hated to do a budget. I hated to make a budget. I'm a spontaneous guy. I'm a party waiting to happen. I got some cash. Let's have some fun. That's the way I live life, right? How many of you realize that you cannot be a generous person and give to others and plan for your future if that's your discipline? I had to learn some disciplines of my faith. I love budgeting now. And, and so there's different things you have to show up, you have to do, you have to learn how to do. And so here are five things that we are called to walk out in our lives that the Word of God says. We have to learn to walk in truth. In, John, in uh, 3 John 3, that we have to walk in His Word. We have to walk in truth. What's that discipline? How do I equip you? There is no way around it. There is no other way to do it. You have to be in the Word of God. My faith, my preaching isn't going to change much in your life. I can encourage you, I can inspire you, but only the Word of God is going to change your situation and change your life. It's a discipline. It's a hard discipline. Man, it took me years. I was a small group leader and I was still missing quiet times. I, I mean, I, I would, and back in my day, we didn't have these apps and the phones with the reminders that popped up and you can just kind of scroll through your fingertip and pick a Bible study, whatever you were dealing with. Back in my day, you had to go to a store and buy a book. <laughs> you had to open the Bible. It was a harder discipline, but I learned those disciplines. Why? Because I had mentors telling me, James, you have got to get in the Word of God. You have got it. They would always say, are you having your quiet time? What are you reading? I started off by reading two chapters a day. That's what I started to do. I'd read two chapters a day. I'm too busy. I've got so many things going on. I forgot. I was the king of excuse, but I knew I had to do it. I knew I had to show up. If I was going to see my life change, I had to be in the Word because the Word was the only thing that was going to change me. So here's what I did. It changed my life. I'm going to give it to you. As I said this, I'm going to feed my spirit before I feed my flesh. Because as you can see, this old boy don't miss too many meals. 
And there's times I'd oversleep. I'd oversleep, but here's what I would do is I would then start fasting and I wouldn't have breakfast until I could have my quiet time. My quiet time is how I fed my spirit. Reading the word of God is how I fed my spirit. And so I, I overslept, bad on me, guess what? No breakfast, grab my Bible, I was in sales, I threw it, the Bible uh, in my uh, passenger seat and I started driving and I began fasting from physical food until I could eat the spiritual food. About lunchtime, I'd start getting hungry. Guess what? I found time to read the Word. It might surprise you I didn't die of starvation. <laughs> this busy guy finally found some time in his life, and, and, I, and I remember literally uh, in the drive through of Burger King smelling flame-boiled whopper, whopper coming out of the, the grill, right? Getting out of the drive through line, finding a parking spot, opening my Bible, reading my two chapters, feeding my spirit, getting back into the drive through to order my lunch. You feed your spirit before you feed your flesh, you'll be spiritually strong with incredible fast, or you're going to be spiritually strong with the Word of God. It's a win-win. you got to walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5. And that is, you got to walk in the Spirit and overcome the temptations in your life. you got to put on the full armor of God. You've got to walk in faith, Romans 5, 7. You've got to have faith in how to handle your money and, and how to handle relationships. And maybe you're praying, Lord, I just pray I win the lotto. If I win the lotto, I'll do all this for all these kind people. Lord, I just pray for a promotion. I pray for my business. And, and God's going to say, look, you got to learn to handle what you got before I give you more. You put God first and start tithing with what you have and show yourself faithful and he will give you more. In fact, the Bible says this about tithing. If he can't trust you with money, how can he trust you with true riches? True riches is the favor of God. But you gotta have faith. Faith is putting him first and giving him the first portion. You gotta walk in love, Ephesians 5, 2, and that is you gotta walk in love and you've gotta forgive. Martin Luther King says, do not let somebody drive you down to the low point of hate. But you gotta have strength to forgive others and walk in that love. And that's hard. Sometimes you don't wanna walk that one out. You wanna sit that one out. But you gotta make the choice. You gotta walk it out. You gotta walk in the newness, 6-4, and that's integrity. That's to understand that when there's no gray area, there's no fudge in a time clock. There's no fudge in an expense report. There's no fudge in this or that on, on, a, on a schoolwork or on tests. There's no gray area. You gotta walk. You gotta, but you know what? That comes at a cost sometimes. When you do the right thing, sometimes that's very costly, isn't it? But you gotta walk that out. It's painful. Ephesians 4 2, let's, let's move on. And it says, Be completely humble and gentle. Those are the requirements to walk without tripping. If you're gentle, you're patient, realize I'm equipping in the long term. Sometimes I just want to be equipped like a microwave oven. It's the old prayer, Lord, I want patience and I want it now, right? It don't work that way. It, 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 this, is, this is the long game we're playing a lot of times. But you got to be patient. You got to be completely humble. That means you got to let people speak into your life and you got to receive that. That's how you get equipped. Ephesians 4, 3 goes on. It says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. The one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all and through all. What is Paul is saying there? This is all you got, baby. It's your family. You can't trade your family in. Your family is all you got. And it's the body of Christ. When you see these things, listen, uh, parenting's hard. Being married, relationships can be hard. But if you want to equip yourself, I'm just saying one of the most fulfilling things in my life is my marriage and my kids. But it's hard. But if you equip yourself, you find the blessing on the other side. You gotta show up for the drills. And if you see these things and you're saying, but it's just too hard, here's where I'm gonna finish. Because on your own, 
it is too hard. And I'm going to even add this. On your own with Jesus, it's too hard. That's why he said, go and make disciples. We need each other. We need the body of Christ. He designed it that you need to be joined to the body of Christ. That's the way he designed it. It's it's no slight against his ability. It's just that he values relationship with him and with one another. And so he gives special gifts to the body of Christ to help us because it is hard at times. And this is what he said. It is he who, in verse 11... It is he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. He's given those gifts, those people, to the body of Christ to prepare God's people for the works of service. That works of service, it don't, it, it's not just usher and uh, you know, children's ministry. Works of service is you going to work tomorrow. You know how God reaches people at Denzo? He takes a priest, a full-time ministry person, disguises them as an employee at Denzo and sends them in. See, our job is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. You're the saints. You come in here, you get equipped. The the way he's going to reach people at the federal center, he's going to take a full-time priest, a saint, disguise them as a federal center employee, send you in to be the light and the hope and the encouragement to the world. That's how he does it. Listen, this is like the pit stops at the, at the Indy 500. This is Daytona, okay? This is the pit stops. You know, you get bumped into the wall, the driver doesn't come into the pit stop and go, it's crazy out there, I'm just gonna chill here with you guys. <laughs> what do you mean you're gonna chill here? You're, you're a racer, get back out there. Four tires, a splash of gas, go, I'll see you next Sunday. But it says to prepare or to equip people to build them up until we reach the unity of faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We put in this effort, we put in the disciplines, we hold ourselves accountable so that we can experience the fullness of Christ. Yes, your prayer time, the frequency, it's going to make a difference in your life. Yes, how often you read the Word of God and let it speak to you, it's going to make a difference in your life and in your situation. Fasting, giving, tithing, praying, yes, those things will make a difference in the situations you face in your life. That's We're here as a church to equip you, the saints, to do the work of the ministry. That is to be the light into the world. I'm a saint with you too. When I reach the lost, I don't do it as a pastor, I do it as a saint. But together, we equip ourselves so that next week we're going to learn so we can be empowered, empowered by His Spirit. I'm convinced if you get a hold of equip, you will receive the power you've been looking for in your life. Amen?